So good morning. Uh, I get to give you the anti-Lumsden talk. Uh, Alan talked to you about some very cutting edge technology that has very recently been developed, much of it here, uh, much of it going to be developed. Uh, I'm going to do the opposite. I'm going to talk about some real nuts and bolts, uh, sort of Neanderthal skills. And I'm going to basically spend 15 minutes telling you what you know, I've learned to do on a daily basis for the last 31 years. So forgive me if I talk fast. Anyway, um, my, I'm also at a little bit of a disadvantage because I don't really know how much familiarity you have with things uh, that we do. So if what I tell you seems too basic, please forgive me. Uh, so nonetheless, uh, it's a bit of a challenge. Uh, you may recognize this individual. Um, as I said, there's a lot of information uh, that's going to be compressed into a short period of time. And, you know, I walked in here, I walked past those displays, and I didn't know what a single tool out there was for, not one. Uh, and I would imagine that if you're trained in open surgery, you feel the same way walking into the cath lab. And the difference is when you're in the cath lab, the tools look really simple, a and most of them are. But what's different than what you do as uh, surgeons doing open procedures is this. Uh, we don't have much control over the devices because we're standing two meters away from the business end of the equipment. Um, so it's a little easier to learn some of the techniques that we do. Uh, but it's, you know, it's much more complex to learn to uh, sew in a valve. But it's also easier for us to do a lot of damage because we're working remotely, and because we don't have the kind of control that you guys have. So with that as background, uh, raise your hand if you know who Werner Forsman was. OK, well, I know people of my generation do. So Werner Forsman did the first cardiac catheterization. How much cardiology do you think he knew? Zero. And there was a reason. He was a urologist. How do you think he got informed consent from the patient? He didn't. Why? Not because it was a long time ago, but because he was the patient. So he did the first cardiac catheterization on himself with a Foley catheter, cut down to his brachial vein, presumably it was a new catheter, uh, advanced it under fluoroscopy to his right atrium, and then what did he do? He got up. He walked down a flight of stairs to Grand Rounds, walked on stage and said, look what I did. And he was rewarded in the appropriate fashion. He was fired. <laughs> and 20 years later, he won the Nobel Prize, 1956. What we do is not very different than what he did, although we don't use Foley catheters for the most part. OK, so that's my history lesson. So there are three laws the, of physics that you have to know. Newton's third law, Murphy's second law, and then the first law of thermodynamics. So probably Newton's the most important guy here. And we'll come back to him. Newton's third law, shown mathematically here, for every force in one direction, there's an equal force acting in the opposite direction. If you have a wire inside the catheter and you pull on the wire, what's going to happen? The catheter will spring forward. You're going to release energy from the catheter. If you push a wire forward, what's going to happen to the catheter? It's going to move back, unless you know it's full of clot and has become adherent to the wire. Every time you push on something, something's going to spring back to you. That happens in everything we do in a catheter system, everything. So if I don't teach you anything else, remember Newton's third law. That's the key to safe and effective cardiac catheterization. Number two, you all recognize Murphy from Narcos, right? Murphy's first law, we all know. Something can go wrong, it will. Murphy's second law, if you play with something long enough, you will break it. If something doesn't work when you're doing it by catheterization, what do you do? Anyone? You do something else. We're all hesitant to do that. One of the things that we, for years, see fellows do when they're starting out is when something's not working, they keep doing the same thing. We've sort of learned 
not to do that. And then uh, Basil talked about hockey. Uh, I grew up in New York City where this is the game. Uh, the first law of thermodynamics, energy within a system remains constant. Anything you do is gonna have a consequence. There's a closed system, there's a fixed, heavenly managed economy. Nothing you do is gonna be inconsequential. There are no minor acts that you perform with a catheter. Closed doesn't mean simple. Okay, so what does this boil down to? It means if something doesn't go easily, it's not meant to be done percutaneously. We've all learned this the hard way. Don't relearn the same lesson. If something's not working, don't keep at it. For us, changing access sites, for example, is not difficult. Uh, it's a little different than having a, a large open incision and saying, oops, if you're working through ephemeral puncture uh, or even a uh, subclavian cut down, which uh, I've learned is a relatively small thing. If that doesn't work, we've got other ways to do it. So if things aren't flowing, there's a reason, and one of those reasons may be it that it's not the correct approach. Okay, so uh, I'll show you not our sterling cases, not things we're proud of. In this one, we pushed too hard. And uh, what you see on your right is by pushing hard in a small, rigid, calcified iliac artery, we tore the artery. Uh, you guys know that's a bad thing, right? Uh, we were able to rescue this patient, uh, mainly because of education in courses like this. When you anticipate these things, you have things out and available at arm's length, you can grab them quick. And fortunately, we've got some vascular colleagues uh, with whom we work really closely. Uh, one of them sitting here. Uh, so, Alan, you actually rescued this particular patient. I have somewhere some great intraoperative pictures that actually I show. And uh, the only person who's ever figured out what was wrong with the picture was a cardiologist who looked at it and said, oh, no aorta. Uh, no one else, including surgeons, had been able to figure out the defect. I don't understand that. I uh, wish I could find that picture. Here's one where we pulled too hard, and you guys recognize this. This is an aortic dissection. We pulled back on the valve and tore the aorta. Uh, we couldn't rescue this patient. Here's his angiogram. Uh, on your right is his uh, 3D transesophageal echocardiogram. You can see the flap pretty clearly. This is a big dissection. This was fatal. Okay, back to Isaac Newton. Really basic principles. You're going to learn a lot of fancy stuff about using these catheters and wires uh, in the afternoon sessions, but you have to know these basic things. Number one, blood is more viscous than air. Pulling a, cath a wire out of a catheter quickly when you have viscous fluid coming from one end and air coming from the other end, guess what's going to get there faster? You'll entrain air in the catheter. Now, that's fine if you are patient enough to vent the catheter, let it bleed back, but we always see people pulling wires out of catheters quickly. Uh, in our cath lab, the staff really don't want to be accused of delaying us. I've yelled at more people. I've physically assaulted more people for doing that. I've been in deep trouble for it. Don't pull wires out of catheters quickly, ever, under any circumstance. And if you think it's come out too quickly, hold that catheter pointing up so the air comes out. Generally, bleeding for, through a catheter is a good thing. You don't bleed very quickly through it, and anything that comes out is bad. Air and blood clots. Okay, Isaac Newton again, blood is non-Newtonian. Its viscosity changes. What does that mean? It means it clots when the flow conditions change. There's shear-induced aggregation from turbulent flow that makes platelets aggregate, turns them on. And then there's contact activation from, cat, from blood sitting in catheters. When a catheter is sitting in place for more than a few minutes, let it bleed back, flush it out. Catheters don't like to have blood in them, and you know, patients don't like to have clots in them. If you cannot pull back through a catheter, what do you do? Take it out, remove it. If you can't pull back, don't ever, ever, ever inject. 
I've been preaching that uh, all my career. I've done it once in my life. And that one time I sent a piece of clot into someone's vertebral artery. If you cannot get blood flow back, you have no business injecting, ever. Okay, clots. Uh, bad things when you're working, good things when you're done. Clots form on wires and in catheters, when the catheters are static and aren't wiped or flushed, even in patients who are anticoagulated. Hence, we have a three-minute rule. And what's that mean? That means when we're trying to cross a valve uh, and we're having a tough time, we use a timer. And at three minutes, we stop. We let the catheter bleed, we take the wire down, clean it off, wipe it down. Why do we do that? Well, you know, people who come in and observe think we're having a contest with one another to see who's faster. We're not. I'd much rather see the first guy cross the valve really quickly so we can move forward with fewer issues. But that's not the reason. Three minutes is the time we allot for a wire to be used and then come out and cleaned off. Why three minutes? I have no idea. That's what I was taught as a fellow decades ago. It seems reasonable. And you know, once in a while we do see clots on wires when we wipe them down. And once in a while when sheaths have been in a long time and haven't been flushed, we bleed them back. And what happens? We see big clots come out. Clots form in these catheters. Don't screw around with them. Don't let blood sit in them. I got three minutes to go, crud. Okay, a little bit about wires. Raise your hand if you have an engineering background. Do you really? Okay, so Dr. Reardon does. That's one. I don't, and no one else does. You hear lots of engineering terms when industry tries to sell you wires. So two pieces of advice. Number one, you will never, ever, ever learn the names of all the wires and catheters available. They just come out too quickly. There are hundreds of them. It'll drive you nuts. Don't bother with that. Learn a few wires. Learn a little bit about them. Don't worry about all the engineering and technical terms. What this boils down to is how rigid or soft is the wire, how easy is it to control, how much feedback does it give you. Two broad categories of wires, J-tips and straight tips. J-tips are made very simply because the J deflects off atherosclerotic plaque when you're advancing it. So it keeps you from getting under plaques, it keeps you from going into side branches you don't want to be in. It's very useful. This is the only kind of wire, with a couple of exceptions, that you ever really want to advance. Straight tip wires. Soft tip here, you can see it's rather rounded on one end. Whenever you get one of these wires, test it against your hand. Make sure you've got the business end, not the uh, back end, which is very rigid. This is not meant to be advanced in blood vessels. It's only got one use in 2018, and that's to cross stenotic aortic valves. It's the only thing you should ever, ever use this wire for. Do not advance a catheter over it. Be patient, take it out, put in a J-tip. And then you can adjust the J-tip. This is the Kleiman J. This is a plain old wire with a small J built onto it. What did we do? We took this wire, and in about three seconds, just ran it over my thumb, so now it has a big curve. Why do we do this? Well, when we do TAVRs and we have one catheter in place, we're advancing now the catheter that is going to cross the aortic valve. When we bring it up, we don't want it to wrap around the first catheter. Otherwise, it catches the catheter, they start moving, it becomes a real pain. So we just take three seconds, put this big J in it as we advance into the aortic arch, and it bounces off everything. Very easy to do, very useful. And then uh, Basil told you a little bit about pre-shaped wires. This wire has this big, broad curve at the end. It's designed for Tavar. The big, broad curve is considerably less noxious than a sharp bend or knuckle that you may get in a wire if you form it yourself. And then there are all sorts of other wires. This is a Woolly wire. This has a very, very soft, floppy tip. This won't go under anything. This is a very, well, almost never. It's a very safe wire to use. These are Lundequist wires. 
These are very rigid. If someone attacks you on the street, if you're carrying this, shank them. And then we've got all sorts of subspecialty wires like filter wires that we use uh, working in coronary grafts and that Alan uses in carotid stents. Hydrophilic wires, I'm out of time, I'm gonna talk really fast. The coating attracts water. These are wires with a proprietary coating, become slippery when wet and really sticky when dry. When the wire is wet, you can't hold on to it to manipulate it. That's both good and bad. It can facilitate tor traversing tortuous and heavily atherosclerotic vessels. It can also slip out of your hands. And it's very frustrating. You spend 15 minutes trying to get the wire where you want it. And what happens, it gets wet, you slip, and you lose control of the wire, it comes back. It can travel over and under atherosclerotic plaques. It can do things you really want it to do, and it can go places God doesn't want it to be. Watch it. It can go along or through vessels. And uh, unfortunately, it doesn't provide tactile feedback. So you can get into a lot of trouble if you don't know how to use these wires. Oddly enough, this catheter is called a pigtail. Um, it's, well, it's got a rounded end. This is used for large vessel and ventricular injections. It's got, <laughs> okay, I won't talk about pigtail catheters. Okay, finally, um, always watch a wire fluoroscopically when you're pushing it. Will this play? Okay, watch the wire here. We do this all the time. When you see that, stop. You're not in the lumen. You're under something. No problem. Stop, reposition the needle, take it out if you have to, put it back in. What you want is this. <coughs> so see how we're twirling this wire back and forth so it moves freely? That's what you want to see. And, uh, you know, I could talk forever, but... I promise not to. So thanks, guys. <coughs> <coughs>